we're pleased to present to you the warrant articles for this year's annual town meeting. Before we do so, I wanted to introduce the members of this year's warrant committee um, seated. Sure. How's that? Better? Okay. Seated to my far left uh, is Rich Forte. To his right, Maureen Arkel, James Stewart, Kathy Gilbody, and to my right, John Cohn, Bob Cox, Brooks Gernard, and Doug Lawrence. We comprise this year's Warrant Committee. The Warrant Committee uh, met beginning in the fall and summer of 2012 to begin reviewing the budget process for this upcoming year. Um, we met with town departments um, and educational entities in order to try and educate ourselves both about expectations for the upcoming fiscal year and what might be coming forward um, in terms of special articles. Since January, we've met individually with each town department, and they presented to us their budget. The guidance for this year was a level service budget. To the extent that that level service budget was going to deviate at all, departments were advised to note with particularity what the deviation would be. Our objective tonight is to provide you with a preliminary FY14 budget, which we will present uh, in greater detail in a few minutes. Um, the annual blue book uh, containing the recommended budget will be prepared and delivered in mid-April, a few weeks prior to town meeting. We've worked very hard this year to try and improve the budgeting process, try and open lines of communication with the various departments in town with an eye towards making the process as transparent as possible, both for the departments as well as for citizens within the town. This year we have 24 articles on the warrant. 13 articles are what are known as housekeeping articles, that is, they're annual recurring articles, um, uh, largely routine, um, and many without financial implications. Ten of the articles are financial in nature, uh, but largely routine, and we'll get to those in a few minutes. Eight of the 24 articles are special articles or non-recurring articles. Three of those are largely non-financial articles, and the remaining five have financial implications. It's our understanding that one article will be withdrawn at town meeting. The breakdown of the articles on the warrant committee, this, uh, excuse me, on the annual town warrant are, uh, in terms of sponsorship, are 11 being sponsored by the Board of Selectmen, one by the Board of Assessors, one by the Planning Board, four by the Regional School Committee, four by the Warrant Committee, one by the Town Clerk, one Citizens Petition, and one from the Council on Aging, which, as I indicated a moment ago, uh, we've received correspondence indicating that that article will be withdrawn at town meeting. The primary financial articles are found in Article 4 of the warrant. Article 4 is the operational budgets for each department within the town. Um, and within that includes amounts to raise and appropriate for salaries and expenditures by departments, officers, boards, and committees of the town as listed in the blue book. This is the bulk of the town's operating budget. Article 5 constitutes the capital budget, and it contains a list of capital items, which the town defines as items more than $5,000 and typically non-recurring on an annual basis that are reviewed by the Capital Budget Committee. Capital Budget Committee makes recommendations and you'll hear from their chair tonight as to those capital budget items. The special uh, articles which are financial in nature, um, as I mentioned a moment ago, four of them come from the Regional School Committee. Um, there are two that relate to the installation of air conditioning at the middle school. Um, the way that the articles were um, presented, um, they were presented in the alternative. Either the town could pay for this through free cash, or alternatively, it could pay for it through borrowing, through bonding it, um, because we have to work with the town of Sherburne, and it was unclear at the time that these articles had to be submitted 
whether they'd be bonded or whether they'd be paid for through free cash. So that's why you see the article listed in the alternative for the air conditioning at the middle school. There's also an article or two articles on the warrant um, from the regional school committee having to do with the approval of the regional school committee's capital budget item. That's a new proposal starting this year that regional school committee is trying to build in on an annual basis a capital budget in order to avoid potentially costlier projects down the road uh, by addressing them um, on an annual basis. And again, those two articles are worded in the alternative. It could either be funded through free cash or alternatively it could be uh, funded through bonding. Article 17 is what is known as the Rail Trail Feasibility Study. Um, for the past year plus, there's been a committee in town that has been exploring the various options associated with converting the uh, unused rail bed that runs through the center of town um, into a rail trail, which could be used for walking, uh, biking, and other recreational activities. The other uh, special articles, which are three in nature, um, Article 11 is sponsored by the Planning Board, um, and that article would create an associate member to allow the board to continue its business when one member cannot be present. There is a citizen's petition, Article 12, um, which would involve the town on votes for town projects on town property, or I should say projects on town property. And then finally, uh, Article 18 is the medical marijuana article. Um, as people may know, there was a citizen's uh, referendum last year on the statewide ballot which passed authorizing uh, the use of medical marijuana treatment centers. However, at this time, there's still relatively little guidance from the state. Regulations have not been issued. So um, an article has been put forward that would give the town some flexibility in being able to manage its affairs given that it doesn't know what the regulations say at this point. So that's a broad overview of the articles from this year. At this time, what I'd like to do is go through in chronological order the articles. Um, tonight is an opportunity for us to present the articles. In several instances, we have chairs or members from departments who will be presenting uh, brief presentations on the articles. Uh, tonight is not an opportunity to debate the articles that comes at town meeting. Um, so if people have questions uh, with respect to speakers tonight, um, we're certainly, we encourage that, but this is not an opportunity for a debating society tonight. Um, and we want to, given the number of articles, we want to stay on task as far as what the, uh, the various topics are. Um, one other item that I neglected to mention at the start of the meeting, I was requested tonight to make a uh, request of everyone. Apparently, cell phones are interfering very badly with the uh, microphones, and people are being requested, unless you're a public safety officer, an EMT, uh, to turn off your cell phone. I asked whether I could put it on vibrate and was told no. So if folks could just turn their cell phones off for the next uh, hour or so, that would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Okay, Article 1. Article 1 is a standard article. It's to hear and act on various reports of the various town committees. This is a boilerplate housekeeping article that's pre presented every year in the town warrant. Um, I don't think there needs to be much discussion on that article. Um, article 2 um, is, again, a housekeeping article presented each year. It's an article that would allow um, certain real estate exemptions for certain residents within town. Um, it needs to be approved annually, and again, that's an, a recurring article that appears on the warrant each year. Article 3 um, is to see if the town will set the salaries for its elected officials for the ensuing fiscal year. Again, a housekeeping matter that um, is present on the warrant every year. Article 4 is the operating budget, as I mentioned previously. Um, I'm going to turn at this time to James Stewart, who's going to give a presentation on the stat status of the town's um, health, both from an operating perspective and a revenue perspective. So, James, if you could speak on that. OK, 
Okay. Um, so I'm going to give an overview of the preliminary budget for fiscal year 14. Um, the details are all in the handouts in the back of the room. And uh, why don't we jump into it? So this first one shows a uh, pie chart with the components of the budget. Article 4 is the preponderance of the budget with about 90 percent or so um, of the uh, spending falling under Article 4. We can't hear you. Article, okay, that might be a little better. Sorry. Um, so Article 4 uh, encompasses about 90 percent of the budget, but with about 90 percent or so um, of the total uh, $33.4 million budget. Debt service under Article 4 is 4.9 percent. Um, special articles are small, uh, below 1 percent. Capital items are almost 2 percent, and that's an estimated number at this point. Uh, the reserve fund is small as well, um, and uh, the snow and ice deficit uh, is, is, is relatively small. Um, the uh, next slide, please. Um, this is a uh, summary which you might be familiar with. Uh, it's what you see in the blue book, um, which describes the revenue sources and expenditures. Next. And this is a pie chart of that. Um, it shows the categories of Article 4 spending. So we've taken that 90 percent and broken it down here. Um, you can see that Chickering School, the operating part of the budget, is, is about 29 percent. The regional schools, the operating part of the budget, is, is also about uh, 29 percent. Um, debt, which includes uh, debt um, uh, service and interest, debt uh, repayment and interest. Um, general government is about 6 percent. Uh, protective service is about nine. Insurance and pension is another big one, about ten, and the others are relatively small. Next, please. Uh, this shows the year to year differences in some of those components. Um, you can see that this year the proposed um, uh, preliminary fiscal year 14 budget um, for Chickering um, at the local schools, which also includes uh, special education. Um, component is up about 9 percent or so. Um, other big increases are um, uh, uh, basically uh, one of the other items, which is sort of, it's, a, it's a small dollar amount. And um, you can see that insurance this year is only up about 2 percent, as previous years it was up almost um, 7 and uh, a large amount. Um, from a dollar perspective, schools largely dominate the total dollar growth. Next, please. Um, this is a summary of the Article 4 spending, just another way to look at it. Um, the uh, Dover Regional Schools are up about $160,000 uh, for operating, about 100000 for debt. The Chickering operating budget, it's kind of hard to see, but um, take my word for it, is, is up about 747000 <coughs> Um, group health insurance is uh, last year was up 140,000. This year it's only up 20,000, which is about one percent. It's from previous years. It's been um, uh, one of the big increases. Next, next slide, please. Um, breaking into the uh, estimated revenue, that was um, um, one of the other important parts of the uh, budget. Um, the preponderance of revenue is from the tax levy, which is 80 percent of the 33.4 estimated revenue. Um, use of free cash this year is, is estimated to be about 5 percent, um, 4.9 or 5 percent if you round it. Um, local receipts is um, about 5 percent and the debt exclusion is about 5 percent. Um, state. Uh, which is an estimated number, um, it's very unpredictable. It's composed of state aid and SBA uh, reimbursement, which is largely steady, but it's very hard to know exactly where things are going to be in that one. Um, next slide, please. This shows the year-over-year -year changes in estimated revenue. You can see that um, uh, the estimation for um, tax levy is up about 3.8 uh, percent. Um, uh, 
and most of the other things are relatively small, uh, even though they might have large uh, fluctuations, but they're, they're relatively small numbers. Next slide, please. Um, this leads us to a budget gap, which um, is, is essentially the amount of expenses over the revenues. And uh, this year we're projecting, or we're working with the preliminary budget and expecting something in the order of uh, 1.6 million. And um, uh, we are comfortable using free cash to close this gap at this point. Next slide, please. This is a summary of the budget gap as a percentage of expenses going back <coughs> several years. And um, you can see that the trend line is about 5% or so. Um, after a few years where we drew relatively heavily on free cash to close the budget gap, um, we have this target of around 5% or so. Um, just to uh, sort of uh, clarify things a little bit, free cash is essentially every year is replenished by turnbacks, that is unspent funds from the town, as well as a uh, major component is um, special education circuit breaker funds coming back from the state, which are also very, very um, hard to predict and subject to lo relatively large variance. Um, and that covers the um, summary. Next slide. Um, and um, the, I, these slides will be available, I think, on the website. So if anybody wants to go back and look at them, thanks. Thank you, James. At this time, uh, we're going to hear from the chair of the Chickering School Committee, Don Fattori. <coughs> Don, could you come up? Good evening. Uh, thank you for letting me be here tonight to talk a little bit about the Dover uh, public school budget. I just wanted to acknowledge that our superintendent, um, Valerie Spriggs, is here this evening. And actually, I see Assistant Superintendent uh, Steve Bliss also came in. So thank you both for being here. Um, so um, let's talk about where we are for fiscal year 14. Um, next slide. So here's our pie chart. Um, our biggest piece of our budget of $9,102,492 is salaries, almost 64%. The next biggest piece of the pie is our out-of-district tuition. That is um, tuition that we pay to schools outside of our district for pre-K through 22. So we cover uh, children in, who live in Dover between the ages of 3 and 22. So that's um, 23%. Um, then after that, we do have some smaller pieces of the pie. We have regular uh, transportation, we have sped transportation, buildings and grounds, and then all of our, all other supplies. And I'm going to go through a little bit more um, on the different pieces next. So we sort of break up our budget and look at it in a couple different ways. So what we've been doing lately is we take our total budget and we look at regular ed. So that's the cost that we experience at Chickering to educate um, our population. Also at Chickering, though, we do have students that stay in district that we provide special education for, and that's our in-district SPED number uh, of a million. So you see we had a 2.58% increase for regular ed this year and a 12.84% for in-SPED, in-district SPED, to give us a total in-district increase of 4%. If you go down to the next line item, our out-of-district tuition and transportation, that's where we saw our big increase this year. We're looking at a 25% increase in that line item. And we'll go through each of those in separate slides. So first for regular um, education, we had a 2.58% increase, but that also includes one new program that I'll talk about at the end, and that's world language. If you take out that $30,000 for that initiative, we have about a 2% increase in our regular ed budget. Uh, we're looking at an estimated enrollment of next year of 487 students with 27 class, size, 27 class sections. That is not changing. That's about a 7% decline in enrollment, though. We're seeing a graduating class of about 105 going out in our fifth grade, and our kindergarten numbers are looking probably around 60, or between 60, mid-60s right now. 
Our biggest piece of the increase, obviously, is salaries. Um, that's 185,000, and that's, uh, we're in the third year of our teacher's contract, um, and those are the stats there for you. We did make some reductions in staff for fiscal year 14 of a 0.4 FTE, a 0.3 is a gym teacher, and a 0.1 was an art teacher. That gave us a salary decrease of about 30,000. We also made some other reductions in supplies. Um, we had about a $12,000 decrease in the regular education transportation because if you remember last year, we approved full day kindergarten. We, did, we got a much bigger reduction in that bus cost than we thought we were gonna do in fiscal year 13. So those come to a um, decrease of about 35,000. So that's our regular ed. Next slide. This is our um, in-district special ed, which we saw an increase of 12.84%. Um, basically, those, the number of students that stay in Chickering that receive special services, um, right now in fiscal year 13 is 71. We're estimating 75 kids for fiscal year 14. So the cost drivers for that increase are we're adding three um, additional SPED aids for 68,000. We have um, also contractual services. Some of our occupational and speech therapy are contractual um, service that, that are, we go outside for. We're seeing an increase of 22,000 for that. And uh, then we have a salary increase of 24,000 with a teacher returning on leave and some other contract increases. So that gives you a picture of what's driving the in-district increase. So out of district, um, this is where we're seeing really the spike in our budget. We are estimating we're gonna have 29 children uh, placed out next year. Fiscal year 14, we had budgeted 24. We actually picked up two already in fiscal year 13 that we're covering. Um, so we have 26 right now. We're anticipating adding three more next year. So from, from budget year to budget year, those five new out-of-district placements increased our tuition by 310,000. We have a couple of cases where children are being placed in residential programs versus day, and that's an increase of 100,000. And then just general tuition increases, it's 50,000. And then the transportation costs resulting in the new placements plus a 3% increase is 25,000. So as I mentioned, um, we do have a new initiative we're adding to Chickering. It's actually Dover and Sherburn. Uh, we, Pine Hill is also adding a world language program. This has been in the uh, research stage for about four years. It's taken that long because it started at um, Chickering, but we realized being a district, we couldn't go it alone, so we had to reach out to Pine Hill. So it's taken us a little time to get both schools on board. But at this point, it's in the budget of both schools. Um, our plan is to implement it one grade per year, so next year it would just be kindergarten, with full completion by fiscal year 19. Um, so the total cost for Dover, once we get to fiscal year 19, and that's based on current year enrollment, would be 135,000. The total cost that's in our budget for next year is 30,000. We have a great uh, PowerPoint presentation on this initiative on our website if you'd like to have more information on that. Questions? Does anyone have a question? Yes. I'm Bonnie Aikens, 18 Greystone Road. Um, our family has been a huge supporter of education in Dover, but I am very concerned about this upward spiral in the costs and the decline in the population. In 2005, there were 601 children in K through 5, and the budget was $6,319,000. Now, next year, you're talking about 487 children. Okay, do the math real fast. That's 114 children. You're taking advantage of this, as I see, by having as small sections as possible. And I, I know the argument, you know, you can't reduce a section when the class goes down by one or two, but systematically the school committee has decided that smaller sections, and they've been 22, now 19, now 17, 
now 16. I understand the terrible problem of special education and how important education is for that population. But something's going to have to give because this budget does not include fringe benefits for the faculty, it does not include retirement, and it does not include insurance on the properties or workers' comp or any of those things. So I don't see how we can sustain with the declining population this kind of budget increase and have the room to add a foreign language, which is terrific, you know, have the room to add full day kinder, all those things are terrific. But I don't think this graph is sustainable. Thank you. Other questions in the back? Gerald Clark, Valley Road, just following up on what Bonnie had to say and really following up on discussion that we had here a year ago. One of the things that the Warren Committee did last year that I thought was excellent was an attempt to represent what the true fully loaded costs of each department was. And that is to say, to indeed include the costs related to benefits, to pension, uh, other associated costs, and indeed even the costs associated with interest payments on those facilities so that we get a true picture of what the entire cost on a programmatic basis is. Uh, to go to Bonnie's point, but perhaps to go to something beyond that, not only is there a declining enrollment, but if you look at your numbers, what you're saying is that more than, essentially one out of every six children, one out of every six children, cannot be supported in their educational program through normal education. And that does not include the out of district and residential students. This is a growth in this alternative education that is just unsupportable. Uh, we, we can talk about what's happening with the federal budget and re everyone recognizes that we're going to hit a wall. But there's a wall here that we're facing also, and um, there's no two ways about it. Last year, when you took the entire education costs of all of the places in the budget that education went, plus added the costs for, it, for athletics for school-age children, it was more than 70% of the entire town budget. That doesn't leave very much. And at some point, what are you going to do? decide you don't have a fire department and a police department? This has got to stop. Nancy, do you, do you want to speak? Nancy Sim, Six Sanger Circle. Don, I just wanted to ask you what the average class size is projected to be, and I know it probably varies from kindergarten through fifth. But right, so our range is 17 to 22 and all of our class sections will be within that range. Kindergarten, okay. right now, we not sure what the enrollment's going to be, so we did peak slip a teacher on Friday in anticipation of it not being enough to make our um, range. So th that okay. is where we are right now, but we are operating within the range. Okay. As I recall, when my students were at Chickering, which was five to ten years ago, that was the same range. Yes, the range hasn't 22. changed. Yep, the range has not changed. I also want to say of my four children, two of them have been on uh, special ed programs and they could not have done without it. So despite the tough numbers to swallow, I firmly believe it's necessary. Well, it's mandated. We have no choice. If the child tests that way, then they, they get the plan. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Thank you. At this time, we're going to hear from Shelley Polson, the chair of the Regional School Committee. Shelley. Good evening, Shelley Polson, Regional School Committee. Uh, we have our FY14 budget. Uh, the story is a little bit different um, in that. Uh, uh, this form actually is on the table, but I, I put it there late, so many, many of you may not have gotten it. Uh, our budget was really um, 
even less than a level service because we take guidelines from uh, the town of Dover as well as Sherbourne, and the guidelines were, were more um, austere in Sherbourne. So it really is an effort between um, two guidelines for us to come up with our budget. As a result, you'll see I, I have revenues and assessments. Uh, I put both up. The revenue shows you that 18 and a half million come from member assessments. That means from the towns of Dover and Sherbourne. Uh, we have an excess and deficiency account, which is our free cash account. This year, for the first time, we're putting $750,000 from excess and deficiency to offset assessments to both towns. It's a much higher figure than normal, and one of the reasons that we're doing it this year is that when the governor's one budget came out, which we refer to as the cherry sheet, for the first time in many years, they, were, um, they have down that, that the uh, regional school in Dover and Sherbourne would receive an additional 500 and, and close to $50,000. Um, then sequestration hit and we haven't heard anything out from the state level. So we, are hope we didn't want to anticipate that we would get that additional money because it hasn't come before. Um, but if it did come to pass, then we would be able to um, replenish our excess and deficiency with that. Um, it's still within um, um, reason to use that much for more excess and deficiency, but it was a hard personal self, uh, self myself. Uh, revenues, that's from federal and state aid. Um, and then we have some revolving accounts, the school cafeteria, um, athletics and whatnot. Uh, so that $21,397,830 830 matches the very bottom line, which somehow didn't make it onto this. Is that, is that all you have, Bill? All right, okay. So the, the total for operating and uh, capital items at the region is 3.91%, and that bottom line is missing, but it is on the handout. Um, and we break that down into operating and capital. I'll be back up here later to speak about the capital item, items. But if you look at just operating for Dover, the increase is 1.71%. Uh, as I said, it's a, a pretty tight budget. There are no new initiatives except for um, a 0.6 guidance counselor position, which we really wrestled with as a school committee, uh, but we are having increased populations up at the high school with a high demand for the college um, entrance um, application process, and that's been a, a, a position that we've needed for a few years, and so um, we finally, in the 11th hour, agreed to put it in. So that is a new initiative. Another initiative which may be considered uh, new but it's, it's budget neutral, is that in our special education uh, line items, uh, there was a um, shifting of funds so that we could add a team leader position as a contract position, no benefits, um, to offset some of the administrative piece because with the increased numbers, all that administrative piece was falling to uh, service providers. And so it's, it's hopefully a more efficient way to service the children effectively. Uh, and. Uh, the 1.71 is the operating. The debt was the largest piece, and that's because there's a, a sizable uh, warrant article that we're coming uh, before both towns to consider relative to the air conditioning of the middle school. Okay, Bill? Thanks. Uh, with uh, salaries uh, being almost 63% of the budget, similar to uh, the local budget, school budget, and benefits being at 13.7, it's amazing that we came in uh, at 1.7% increase because both those line items were actually much higher than, um, than that. The salaries uh, over, on average were over 3% increase and um, health insurance, which is usually our larger, our other um, um, figure that we wait to hear from because we belong to a suburban coalition that sets the rate, that was 4%. So the reason why we were able to bring things down really was so many line items were 0% uh, growth. Uh, we, we have deferred some purchases um, again this year and last year, so it's a really, really tight, lean budget. And that really was to make, see if we can make both towns comfortable with the budget. Um, the enrollments, I just want to point out that 2014, that 622 for, for Dover and 530 for Sherborne is not our projection for next year. That was literally looking after looking at this year's figures. Um, the assessments to each towns are calculated according to a regional contract um, that we have that literally looks at the number of students in both towns on a given date in the fall. Um, and 
in effect, it helped us a little bit this year in that there was a shift up in population at the region for Sherborne. Next one. And this is the last slide. I will go into the two Warren articles separately, um, but they are included in the first slide as our debt. So there's a, a, a large one, 853,000, which would be um, air conditioning for the middle school. And then a much smaller one, but still significant for the towns, 122,000. And that's for a number of capital items, which I'll detail separately. Uh, favorables, what, what went in our favor this year? Uh, our utilities were a set rate, so there was no increase. Uh, the salaries, this is the third year of a favorable contract, uh, so that has worked out well in terms of putting the budget together um, with two sets of guidance. Uh, the health insurance rate was only 4%. Initially, we thought it was going to be coming in, come in higher. And sad, we have a number of uh, administrators leaving at the middle and high school and administration office, including our cur current superintendent, Valerie Spriggs, who we will... Um, missed greatly. The favorable piece is oftentimes when we hire administrators, they come in at a lower salary because they don't have the, the um, length of experience. Uh, and challenges. Uh, we are we were agreeing that the $750,000 from our excess and deficiency was going to be a one-time whopper. So I'm hoping that next year we don't come back using more of that ex excess and deficiency because it is the only fallback that the regional school committee has um, for exorbitant costs that, that aren't planned for. Um, murky incomplete figures from the federal and state government, we still don't know, you know, that, that cherry sheet that has $550,000 on it, it was dangling before us and we may not see a penny of it, but hopefully we'll see something in between. But it was hard to pull a budget together when there was that significant a revenue difference um, projected by the state. Uh, the uh, all three schools, uh, four schools, so Chickering, the middle school, the high school, and Piney Hill all had an outside um, company do a 20-year capital assessment of our needs, and um, it's significant funding. So this 122000 that we're asking for this year is a very, very, very small amount of, of uh, the total bucket, and um, I'll show you one slide later on that shows you what, what we have to look forward to in coming years. And then uh, staffing challenges. So the, the populations are getting smaller at Chickering, but they are moving up to the middle school and high school. So although there were some um, recommendations uh, by the school administrator, leader, administrator leaders to increase some staff positions, this is specific to the high school, um, it, it was not recommended by the superintendent nor by the school committee. So we are finding some challenges to uh, make it work with more children uh, and the same amount of, of staff. That's it. Any questions? Nancy? Uh, Nancy Sims, Six Sanger Circle. Shelley, what, if you use 750000 of the E&D, how much is left? The, the, the maximum amount, well, Val, I don't have my books over yonder. Uh, I mean, Valerie, there, can you look it up while I'm looking? The it, maximum we're allowed to have is 5% in our excess and deficiency of our budget, and this will bring it down to 3.49. You're within the recommendation on your policies, right? So the actual, the actual number I'll look up in my book, Nancy. Okay. It, just, it doesn't leave us with a dry well for next year? It's, it's or not a dry year. well. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Can you come up to the microphone, please? Thank you. Maxwell Morton, Sterling Drive. Uh, could you comment about the turnover in the teacher population and how it compares from year to year? And secondly, could you please comment on the aging of the teaching population so we get a sense of whether or not future salaries will be lower than they presently are, or will they increase as teachers gain more experience in general? Okay. I'll partially answer that, and then I'll ask uh, Mrs. Spriggs to come up and answer better, because I don't, don't have the answers. Um, every year we have um, some teachers retire, and so the last few years there's been three or four. This year we only had one retirement, and that has actually resulted in some money going back into our excess deficiency because the new, the, or we, we know it when, the, when we're pulling together your operating budget. Um, 
that we'll be hiring them to lower rates. So it's not, that's sort of how we work the budget from year to year. So perhaps Mrs. Briggs can tell you what the what we're forecasting the next few years. But in the last few, there's been three or four each year, and this year there was only one. With respect to the age range, I'll ask Mrs. Briggs to address that. Um, but that is part of. Um, budget cycle each year. We know when they have to let us know about retirements. We know when they have to let us know about um, some leaves. So we've had maternity leaves and child rearing leaves. Valerie, do you mind answering more completely? And turnover, uh, Valerie will have to answer. Valerie, you're have to come Valerie, to can microphone. you come up to the front, please? Thank you. The teacher turnover has been very stable in Dover, Sherborne, and um, example this year, most of the turnover that we're experiencing is in the administration, it's not within the teachers. Um, I, I would say that probably over the last couple of years, we've begun to go into a senior faculty where they're beginning to retire. Uh, not at a rapid rate. It's been very gracious as far as the delivery of instruction and the experience that we have um, have benefited by. Uh, within the next couple of years, I don't anticipate that it will be a um, massive turnover as some experience, some school districts do experience, but I do think it will continue as people reach that retirement age um, or begin begin coming close to it. Um, so I'm, I'm afraid we don't have a financial prediction. Uh, we do ask that our teachers and administrators notify us by February 1st if they're planning to retire so that we can include that in our budget projections. Did that help a little bit more? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie. Any other questions? Thank you, Shelley. The next article on the warrant is Article 5, which is the Capital Budget Article. And at this time, I'm going to ask uh, the Chair of the Capital Budget Committee, Mike Assetti, to come up. Thank you, Mike. Uh, thank you, Andy. Thank you, Warrant Committee. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Mike Assetti, this year's Chair of the uh, Capital Budget Committee. Uh, the function of the uh, Capital Budget uh, committee is to review, to vet, to recommend to the Board of Selectmen, to the Warrant Committee and town voters um, the annual capital budget, which includes Article 5 as well as any other special articles. Uh, the committee's recommendations are then published in the Blue Book um, that's produced by the Warrant Committee prior to town meeting. Uh, and we also prepare a five-year outlook of potential capital expenditures. Uh, the CBC is comprised of uh, seven members, three at-large members, uh, selected for three-year terms, uh, a member from each of the Board of Selectmen and the Long Range Planning Committee, and then two members of uh, Warrant Committee appointed to, uh, to one-year term. Um, the uh, annual capital budget process gets started in August, when we go out to all the committees, organizations within the town, request their, uh, their, their request for the, for the upcoming five years. Um, they submit those to our committee in October. We then uh, meet, deliberate with, e with each one of those, review those, and uh, to better understand and discuss their requests. Um, you know, I'd like to take a moment now to thank all of those committees and organizations that, that met with us over the course of the year. As I said, we met with all of them. We uh, went out to a number of different organizations to, to look at the capital that they were requesting. And I think overall, I think it was a, a, a smooth process um, this year. Um, I put a, a spreadsheet of the capital requests um, in the back of the room. Uh, it's a two-sided spreadsheet. Uh, we're going to focus on the uh, 2014 requests, fiscal year 2014 requests tonight. I'll quickly go over those, and then if there are any questions, you know, can, can take those as well. So, um, the, uh, the first, and there, there are 22 different requests this year. Uh, the total amount requested, or the total amount that the CBC is recommending is uh, 646,000. And that's, that's roughly in line with what um, we've seen as capital over the past five, six, seven years. Of course, some years are more, some are less. 
Um, but it's generally in line, um, and that's something we like to see. Um, we generally like to, to have our capital come in in a, in a relatively uh, predictable manner. Uh, it's relatively flat. You can't always manage that, but this year it isn't generally in line. So uh, the first item we'll just go down through the list is a request for utility vehicle from the uh, cemetery. And the numbers that are shown in here are gross numbers. Most or several of the items in here, there could be potential trade-in value on that, on them. Uh, the 22825 you see here for the uh, utility vehicle um, you know, is expected to be offset by some, some uh, trade-in value. Um, the, uh, the next item, there are two items for the fire department. One is uh, $75,000 for a squad two truck. This is a, uh, uh, a truck that provides off-road access to wooded areas, general access in inclement weather. It was uh, acquired in 1984, so it's been around. Uh, the money will be used to, ref to refurbish it, substantially refurbish it. We had looked at um, potentially would it make sense to replace the vehicle, and uh, recommendation to us, and we agreed, was that it would be very hard to replace this vehicle. It has a thousand gallon tank on it, and it would be hard to find, I actually couldn't replace a vehicle that's that maneuverable with that large of a tank, and given that you know, Dover um, is on you know, well water, it was a really important feature of the truck to be able to, uh, to carry that much water. Um, uh, the, um, replacing the truck, even with a, 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 um, a truck with a smaller tank would be 150, 170,000. We anticipate that the, uh, the refurbishment will add 10 to 15 years. We'll get 10 to 15 uh, more years off of the truck. Um, other item from fire is just more of a routine replacement of uh, breathing apparatus bottles. There's a life to those, so uh, just a replacement of, of those bottles. Um, th the largest single item we have this year is a street sweeper from the, uh, the highway department. The uh, street sweeper was acquired in 1997. Uh, it gets a lot of work out, especially this time of year. Um, also with the, the storms we've had, it's been used for everything from glass to oil spills. Um, so that is, uh, is ready to be replaced. Um, library, a request for $15,000. This is for uh, the lower children's rooms, uh, furnish furnishings, um, shelving. The actual cost of this project is over 35,000. The request to the town is uh, for 15,000 of that. Uh, the balance it's anticipated would, uh, the library would come up with uh, through grants, uh, um, trustees, and, and other sources. Um, parks, parks and recreation, uh, there's, uh, you can see there's a, a zero in the uh, large tractor mower request. Uh, uh, parks and recreation had requested uh, 35, close to uh, 36,000 for, for this mower tractor. Um, CBC felt like we could get another year out of the one that was, uh, that's in service now. It was uh, uh, put in place or was acquired in 2008, um, so we just um, recommended not to, uh, to uh, uh, replace that this year or in the coming year. Um, other items for park and recreation were a uh, department vehicle for um, uh, you see 24,860. This is a vehicle that was acquired in year 2000. Um, and then the next item is refurbishment of the Carroll Center uh, gym floor uh, for, for 4,200. Under uh, police department, uh, two uh, patrol vehicles. And um, we've, we've typically replaced patrol vehicles on a somewhat regular schedule, whereby we will replace two one year, one the subsequent year, two the following year, et cetera. There's nothing magical about that for me. It seemed to work. Um, we evaluated that and questioned that, and we determined that we will replace or recommend replacing uh, two vehicles this year. Um, there is a, a request for uh, $30,000 for a, uh, a middle school uh, radio receiver or radio receiver that the police use that's based at the, at the regional school. Um, that passes the signals on um, current units 11 to 14 years old. Um, and then last item under police is 17,000 for a mobile computer interface. This is um, required by the state. State's moved to a new uh, internet-based system. It's a server-based software that allows for direct communication um, with the police vehicle laptops and state and federal agencies. Um, also in that category under, under animal control is a, a request for 35,000. 
this is for uh, replacement of a current vehicle, and the replacement would be for a um, customized uh, mini step van. Uh, expected life of that is 10 years. This would be a vehicle that's specifically um, uh, for the for the purpose, specifically fitted for the uh, for the job. Um, next, then moving down to schools, there is a request for 27,500 for drainage improvement, road widening. Um, in there's a, uh, a fire road that goes around most of the building. This would uh, be for uh, repaving and widening that. Right now, the road isn't wide enough for uh, police vehicles to, to, uh, to um, they, they need to go off the road. They can still get through, um, but the plan is to, to widen that. Uh, in some places, the road's deteriorating. It's also to uh, help uh, resolve a, a roof drainage issue. There's um, drainage um, issues along the exterior walls in the back towards the playground that are causing some erosion. Um, a request for just a little over 20,000 for library carpet replacement. Um, the carpet there is original to the building. Um, a request for uh, 5427 for sidewalk lighting. These are lights that are on the, uh, the front of the building along the, the uh, uh, sidewalk or the uh, circular drive where cars come in. Replacing those uh, lights, upgrading those to LED. Um, a request for uh, 6882 6, for cafeteria power shades. These will be used to darken the cafeteria uh, for presentations, uh, help a little bit with cooling, um, heating, or heat conservation. And then if you flip to the other side, of the sheet, a couple items under technology. We always break out the facilities versus the technology. The two items on the technology side are a uh, request for uh, 24,800. This is um, for just replacement of age hardware. So both um, desktops and laptops that are anticipated to be purchased. And then a request for 14,000 for grades two and three device implementation. This is to provide the hardware to do a pilot of uh, iPads that will you know, fit in with the curriculum. Originally, the thought was to roll this out to the entire two grades. Uh, it was later revised to say, let's pilot this. Let's test this out, see, see how well it works, make sure we have um, good adoption of this program. And then uh, final category, uh, request from selectmen, townhouse roof repairs for $15,000. A uh, request for $10,000 for uh, carpeting that goes in the children's area. We thought it made sense to put those two requests together. Um, the request earlier from the library and the, the carpet replacement. And then painting of the clock tower uh, cupola and gutters and the, the uh, fascias. So those are the uh, requests at this time. Are there any questions? Yes. I have a question about the animal control vehicle. Sure. Um, I believe the origin of this vehicle was that somebody didn't need it anymore, so the animal officer got it. I'm not exactly sure what year that happened. But now we are replacing the vehicle. And I think we need to be very careful going forward. When we acquire a previously used vehicle in this town, all of a sudden it becomes somebody's. And then the next thing you know, we're spending $35,000 to replace, replace it. So we've got this growing stable that we, quote, didn't pay anything for. But now we've got to replace it. My yeah, second question about this is, I believe the animal control officer works for two towns. And does the other town share in the cost of this equipment? So, um, so good questions. The um, vehicle was acquired in, in 2005, and as you said, I, and I believe this is true, it was repurposed. Um, it's, it's an SUV. The vehicle that's uh, been requested and that we're recommending is per, uh, specifically, you know, designed for this job and expected life, I think I mentioned before, is 10 years. You know, we, we really wanted to understand what, what use does the vehicle get? Do we need this? And if you look in the 2001 town report, there were 541 calls for the vehicle, um, or, or calls for animal control. There were 81 dogs picked up, 44 deer hit, um, you know, 
over 200 other animal calls, multiple uses for the vehicle. So one of the questions that we asked as a committee was, you know, do we need this? If we don't have a vehicle, what will we use? Um, we uh, were convinced that there's sufficient need for a vehicle in, in town. Um, and then, I'm sorry, the second part of the question? I believe what we shared the officer with another town, did they share any of these costs? So, um, I know that it's used about 20 hours a week, so it may be that the person who's the animal control person works in another, I don't know. This is a capital request for Dover. So. Let's find out. Well, the, this vehicle is for Dover. It's not going to be used for other, by other towns. Jerry. I seem to be following Bonnie on a regular basis. Uh, I guess I also am confused because I know that the ACO is in fact predominantly a Needham officer. And the truck is clearly painted Needham animal control. That's what we've been using in the past. So I am really confused about that. Uh, indeed, as Bonnie said, the old truck sat in the lower parking lot for months. I could never quite understand why we were letting it rot away there. I understand now that we gave it away, according to Bonnie. Uh, as far as your comments about various animal calls, uh, uh, 2001 is probably not relevant. The question is, what's the most recent experience? And when it comes to non-dogs, and by that specifically deer and other animals hit, it's my understanding that traditionally it is the street department that picks up roadkill, not the ACO. If I had said 2001, I apologize. It was the 2011 town report. Okay. Um, vehicles used not just for hit animals or killed animals, it's used for live animals, animals that, that could be dangerous as well. Um, I don't know um, if the truck is labeled for Needham. I don't know if there's anyone else that could comment on that. Well, the, the, this is, the this past is for Dover experience vehicle. has been that it was essentially the Needham ACO who also covered Dover. Dave, do you want to speak to this? reference to Needham was in the past we had purchased a used animal control vehicle from the town of Needham um, to replace the use of a personal vehicle by the animal control officer. I can't remember exactly when that was, but we, bought, we stole it from Needham. We got the useful life that was left out of it. And then when we had to get rid of that vehicle, we used a police car, which is the current vehicle, as its replacement. So this would replace that. The, dog, the, the animal control officer works for both Dover and Medfield. And as Mike said, this vehicle would be dedicated to Dover's use. Thank you, Dave. Any other questions? Uh, yes, Scott. Scott Side in 53 Main Street. Maybe you said it, but could you just explain again why the library carpeting is under Selectman's budget versus the library budget? Thank you. Sure, and I, 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 I'll take a shot at this. I think I've got this right. The library um, building is owned by the town, and so therefore the facilities um, would come under, you know, the request would come under the Selectman's area of the uh, capital request. Nancy. Nancy Sims, Six Sanger Circle. Mike, do you know offhand what the average mileage is on the police vehicles? I know that they get driven a lot more than my car and your car, but what is a yearly average for the police vehicles? And it might differ from the police chief versus the officers. It, it does. And so you know, I, I will tell you this, that the ones that we're looking at replacing, we anticipated by the time they're replaced, they'll be um, 80 to 100,000 in miles. And when you look at the absolute mileage, you know, the police chief and others have told us that's not necessarily the best gauge for replacement, that it's often, there's a lot of time where they're, they're idling, 
you know, they're, they're not highway right. miles as we know. Uh, but at the point of replacement, it would be between 80 and 100,000. Um, these, um, the, item, the cars that are being replaced are both, uh, they're Crown Victoria vehicles. Um, uh, both are 2011 model year. Uh, one was put into service actually in 2010, the other in 2011. So you, you know, kind of do the quick math. It's, it's maybe 25,000 25, a year, something like that. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, thanks. The next item on the warrant is Article 6, um, which is an annual article to fund the Unemployment Compensation Fund um, in the amount of $10,000. This is an annual recurring article, appears each year. Article 7, which is the next article, again, a housekeeping article. It's the payment of accumulated sick leave to retired police officers pursuant to their contract. Um, that's being funded in the amount of $20,000, again, an annual recurring article that appears each year. Article 8 is the next article. Um, that is an article to receive state-funded highway construction projects and, and state monies, Chapter 90 monies, if you will. Um, again, a housekeeping article. The next article on the list is Article 9, which is the revolving fund articles. Um, as you'll see, it lists uh, various revolving funds in the building department, the Board of Health, and the library, and the dollar amounts, uh, the not-to-exceed amounts that are listed there. Uh, those are essentially dollars that can come in and be expended without requiring a further appropriation. Again, that's a housekeeping issue. These are approved each year um, at town meeting. The next item on the warrant is Article 10. Um, this is an article proposed by the Council on Aging um, to fund a feasibility study on constructing a senior center. Uh, we've received correspondence from the Council on Aging that they intend to withdraw that article at town meeting, so we're proceeding as if that article is going to be withdrawn. Article 11 is the next article uh, sponsored by the Planning Board. This article would create an associate member of the Planning Board, um, and as it's been described to me, um, over the course of multiple night hearings, um, over months, if not years, there may be occasions where a member of the planning board is unavailable. Uh, this results in either delays to the process or having to start it over without the uh, ability to designate an associate member. So this is a, a governance uh, tool for the planning board to allow it to carry out its business. Are there any questions on that article? Article 12 is the next article on the warrant. It's a citizen's petition uh, that required the town, prior to commencement of any project on town-owned property for which half or less of the cost is to come from town appropriations to um, provide specifications um, and expenses to the Board of Selectmen for review, and in the event that the costs exceed $50,000 to require that it be approved by town meeting. And I, I think Barbara Palmer is here. Hi, Barbara. Do you want to come up and speak to this article? Thank you, sir. It's my pleasure to introduce Warrant Article 12 to you this evening. I'm going to aim it at you because these poor souls have already heard my spiel. Warrant Article 12 is about the will of the people. Its purpose is to give voice to an idea so basic that you wouldn't think it needed a voice, that public lands belong to the public, and that it's up to the public to decide how to use them. Perhaps this article is best described as protecting the prerogatives long afforded citizens who live under the town meeting model. For the last 300 or so years, Massachusetts towns have offered a consistent example of direct democracy that even today influences our expectations on how we should conduct our business. 
Meanwhile, there is a state statute that affords our parks commissioners considerable unilateral authority to improve parkland owned by the town, while at the same time stopping short of rendering them the owners of the land. Nowhere have I found evidence that the authority of commissioners trumps the collective will of the people. This article applies only to land development projects where more than 50% of the funding comes from private sources. The people of Dover must be able to decline a private gift they do not want or they're afraid they cannot afford. They need to be empowered to weigh in on what constitutes improvement. I, I, there are a lot of us here who have trouble with the idea that replacing trees with astroturf can be so regarded. The people need tangible evidence of serious planning and analyses in order to make rational judgments. If a project is t intended to be a commercial venture, well then there better be a market for it that's confirmed by planning. Um, even if all the financial stuff makes sense, there's another and perhaps bigger question, and that is that we need to have an, impar an impartial resource, an impartial source, who on the one hand looks at the value of the project itself and weighs that against the human costs that result from dramatic changes in land use. Such projects irreparably change the character of our town. The effects are irreversible, at least in our lifetimes. This constitutes a huge responsibility for the town and a very heavy burden on people who are proposing such projects. Now it's true that the concerns about the proposed development of Carroll Park gave rise to this warrant article. Certainly, the, the information standards that I was talking about earlier, concrete evidence, planning documents, and so forth, so far, such things have, it, it, those standards have not been met in this case, not even close. These are serious concerns because information deficits potentially subject the town to considerable financial risk down the road, building to a scale that's not supported by the demographics, starting something and running out of money, um, failing to collect sufficient revenues such that the facility um, can't pay for the maintenance and the replacement costs uh, which will fall to the taxpayers eight or ten years down the road. This dilemma further underscores the need for the warrant, this warrant article. It offers the only guarantee that I think we're going to get that henceforth um, development projects that involve private philanthropy will have ob ob uh, ob obligations such as providing program information, undergoing a third party review, and being governed by the will of the people. Now I want you all to know that we have sought and profited from feedback about Article 12, starting with the Town Council back in January. Since then, concerns have surfaced dealing with language imprecision that could lead to confusion and uh, perhaps broader than intended application. At town meeting, we will introduce an amendment to reduce, if not eliminate, such potential by raising to, I'm not, this, we, a lawyer hasn't seen this yet, so I'm not sure I should be speculating on it, to a larger number. I'm thinking $150,000 rather than the $50,000 that's uh, currently in the article. Um, raising that sum that would trigger the project being subject to this article. And by limiting the article's scope to designated parklands. Uh, I'm actually confident that when you hear about this article next, you will be, it will be more worthy of your support and I hope that we can further discuss it on May 6th at the uh, town meeting. I don't hear well, though I have two um, hearing aids here. So if, if I, I may refer to uh, others in the audience if, to deal with your, uh, with your questions, if there are any. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. 
it's not a question. So Could you much. state your name and address, uh, please? Thanks. Uh, Josh Klebanoff. I'm not actually a taxpayer of the town of Dover, but I'm here on behalf of some of the taxpayers of the town of Dover. I'm with Gilman McLaughlin and Hanrahan. Uh, for those of you who regularly attend uh, the selectmen meetings, you may be familiar with Bob McLaughlin. I'm here on his behalf. Um, one of the expenses that I think I won't put it as eloquently as Barbara did, but that um, I think the taxpayers have a right to know about is that there are concerned citizens who um, are willing to litigate this issue if it comes to that. And while they may have private funding, as Barbara mentioned, the maintenance of the fields is going to fall on the taxpayers. And uh, just tonight I've heard people concerned with the spending of the town and uh, the decrease in the number of students at the school. And I just think that people, when they vote uh, at the town meeting, should be aware that there are costs associated with this project that go beyond the private funding that may have been presented. So, Did you have a question for the, for the oh, speaker? No. no. I, I had mentioned I just wanted to supplement what Barbara okay. was. Yes, Nancy. Hi, Barbara. Hi. Um, Nancy Sim, Six Singer Circle. I don't have a question, but I wanted to uh, make a clarification. Um, two clarifications. One, it's never been the position of Park and Rec that any of the funds for this project will be uh, a place of burden on the taxpayers, that there are plans in place to um, accrue funds for carpet replacement. I think I'm going to turn this way. And secondly, and more importantly, perhaps, um, the Park and Rec Commission, I'm one of the elected Park and Rec Commissioners. There are five of us um, voted into office by you all. Um, we are going before the Board of Selectmen tomorrow night and presenting to them a uh, non-binding question to be presented on the May 20th, to be included on the May 20th ballot. Um, it will ask um, the townspeople, not just the 37 people who are the sponsors of Article 12, but all voting members of the town of Dover, um, whether they are in favor of the field or not in favor of the field. And although this question is non-binding from a legal perspective, um, the Park and Rec Commissioners will be giving their word to the Board of Selectmen that uh, it will abide by the vote count on May 20th. With that in mind, I think that that's probably a more widely encompassing and more fair way to um, get us a flavor from the town as to whether there's a majority of people who approve the project or who disapprove the project. So thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Jim, did you want to speak to this issue? Yes. Of course. Good evening. Jim Dawley, Chairman of the Board, Selectman. Andy, if it's okay with you, I know this is not a debate, but I wanted to keep this particular article online, and we did seek the Town Council's opinion as to um, uh, the legal aspect of this going forward. And if it's okay with you in the Warren Committee, I'd like to paraphrase the uh, Town Council's opinion. Yes, go ahead, please. Thank you. While I appreciate uh, a citizen's petition and support this. Clearly, this particular article is geared to eliminate a project in town. And when this, the citizen's petition first came up, the Board of Selectmen um, discussed it, and we felt the citizen's petition, as written, is too far reaching. And in effect, um, hurts certain levels of democracy specifically undermining elected officials in their ability, both under mass general law and town bylaw, to do their job as an elected official. That being said, as a general matter, Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 44, Section 53A, authorizes, and I'll paraphrase because it's long, basically a, an officer or department, i.e. elected uh, official can receive grants and donated goods and do whatever they uh, uh, legally can do to the land or the property that they control. That's Mass General Law. 
And uh, town council, and I quote, a court would probably find that the statute preempts the local article if any conflict between them arose. He then went on to cite three examples, uh, two of which gives exclusive power upon a commission. One, cemetery, to approve improvements, and two, to uh, park commissioners, to improve parks. Those are Massachusetts general laws that I'm quoting, and if I have the general laws if you'd like them. Quite honestly, the only one that's been identified, the only group, the only town property that would be hurt is the Chickering School. And I'll give you an example. The PTO, I believe, is trying to replace the um, uh, playground area. And there's a cost in excess of $50,000. Under this particular citizen's petition, if in fact it was voted in, the PTO in Chickering couldn't put that new playing, uh, um, playground in until it went to town meeting. That is the only group that is identified from our town council's opinion that would most definitively be hurt by this. Now, <clears throat> you know, it's just too far reaching. Um, the Board of Selectmen in discussion and in open meetings have, uh, uh, will not support this uh, as written. Um, and uh, I, I thank you for listening to me, but again, the Town Council's opinion is very important at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. May I respond? I, know it's not I, I, I think we're, we're running into time issues. Keep it brief, please. Uh, absolutely. Thank you. I, I can say something that will make Mr. Dolly happy. The amendments that we're talking about, uh, that time doesn't allow me to go into in great detail, will get the school system off the hook unless they're making playgrounds on park land. Uh, that's one deal. Um, the other thing is, I, 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 maybe we haven't said it in, loudly enough, but I read uh, town council's uh, ruling this morning too. I, I wish I'd had it to read back in January when we were working on the language of this article. But there's a problem, I think there's a potential for an ongoing problem here. And it has to do with our being a very affluent town and being in a position where uh, philanthropic interests can repeatedly come forward with gifts to the town. And what I think I heard you saying was, okay, well that is a problem as far as the law is concerned. It takes, a, the selectman now can just do this without waiting around for anybody else. But please tell me what protects the town from getting gifts, private gifts, it does not want. That, that we're, that's still a crux of our concern. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Hi, uh, do you want to comment on Article 12? Otherwise, we were going to move on. OK, if you could come to the microphone. Barbara, I think you're being called back to the mic. No, I don't. No? OK. Um, Justine, at your town, Haven Street. Um, just one, que uh, one question to Nancy and then a second follow-up. Nancy, why not have a binding referendum on the ballot regarding the park? I think this is legalese. It's a non-binding question, but Park and Rec is um, agreeing to abide by it. That's a question for town council. It's a, the type of question, but we have stated that we will abide by the vote count. So we will be bound by the vote count. Well, I'd love to see it binding. I guess that's a comment. For what it's worth. Whatever that's a town lead, council question. We've been told that that's, we can't do that. Okay, and, and then a second point, and this has to do with those folks who perhaps aren't following this um, issue as closely as some of the rest of us who are in the weeds, as it were. Um, it strikes me, uh, on a Haven Street many years ago, in 84, I think it was, 
Um, the Board of Selectmen at the time, none of whom, by the way, are current board members, uh, signed an agreement in the summer to allow New England Telephone, 9X, uh, to put, now Verizon, to put a cell tower in our neighborhood. And those of us, it occurred in July, <clears throat> many people were away on vacation, and those of us who were affected by it were appalled that the selectmen, elected officials, again, not this board, another group, could do this without a town meeting vote. It turned out subsequently that that decision that they made was illegal because there was, and I would like vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the park and rec issue, this to be researched by town council, because there apparently was a law in the books at the time that said if there was a long-term lease, and I cannot, by the way, remember X number of years, whether it exceeded five years or 10 years or whatever, um, the long-term lease could not just willy-nilly be voted upon by the Board of Selectmen, but actually had to go to the full town meeting. So my question, uh, and this maybe Nancy can talk to, or at some point for town meeting, we can get into the weeds on this, is this $3 million that some anonymous donor or a variety of anonymous donors are purportedly um, to give to Parks and Rec to construct the turf fields at Carroll Park, is it really a gift? Or is there a contract involved? For instance, is John Smith Soccer, I don't know, involved in this in any way and expects to get a quid pro quo? Um, not to single out John Smith Soccer, but any private organization that wants to use public land, but for private profit for their sports teams, it would appear to me, if that's going on behind the scenes, that we're talking about not merely a philanthropic thing, but really a commercial adventure. In which case, I would, and I know you're volunteers on the Warren Committee, and I know the selectmen are volunteers, but I would like to see some due diligence, whether we hire attorneys or whatever, to look at the uh, donation issues vis-a-vis -vis Park and Rec to see what we are dealing with here. Because at least from what I can tell going to many of these meetings vis-a-vis -vis, um, the need, quote unquote, for this turf field with declining number of students, I've heard that over and over again. Second, I keep hearing that Dover has a uh, park and rec department that's funded at about 350000 a year with Justine, is there, is there a question in there here is a for question. Nancy? Okay, There's can you get question. to the question? The question Thank you. is, why is Dover paying 350000 a year when Sherburn, for its staff, and Sherburn pays nothing for its park and rec staff, and yet Dover's staff seems to um, take over the responsibility for taking over um, services for Sherburn? Could uh, someone answer that for me? I've never understood well, uh, that. And is there a Let contract? Let me briefly respond on that. The Park and Rec has a revolving fund. It's not their three, that they have a $350,000 budget. So I think those are apples and oranges. They have revolving funds that, that are rolled over from year to year. It's in Article 4, I believe. There's isn't there $350,000 that I just saw today in Article 4? Well, I think you're talking about their revolving funds. But you know that's really not a debate for tonight. Um, I'm sure that Nancy or Scott or any of the other commissioners from Park and Rec could speak as to their budget. but. Um, you know, the article before us tonight is Article 12. Well, and is I think there we any wanna... contract? Let's stick to the, the initial. Is there any contract involved vis-a-vis -vis the three million that's purported to be given? We have no idea. That's completely speculative at this point. There's no, well, no knowledge that we have on that. We don't, we don't know that dollar one has been raised at this point. Thank you. Okay. We're going to move on to, uh, to the next article on the list, which is actually the next four articles. Articles 13, 14, 15, and 16 are all regional school committee articles, and I'm going to ask Shelley to come back again to speak to those four articles. Tough to follow when I'm asking for money. The uh, Article 13 is a, is a uh, Warren article asking the town to approve $853,000 uh, through uh, boring authorization at the regional uh, schools. And the purpose is to air condition the middle school. When I mentioned that before, someone in the audience went, no. And I uh, thought my short little speech was going to um, be short until I saw that no and I realized the hurdle. I was on, I I'm with you in theory. I was on the building committee for the Chicken Chickering Elementary School and I think we considered air conditioning for three minutes. And it came off the table. 
The middle school building committee, uh, actually is the regional campus, that building committee did also entertain the notion of air conditioning and the original plans had air conditioning for the middle school in it. They cut it out because of budget reasons. The middle school has been open since 2003. It's now 2013. It has been hotter than hell in there. However, being on the school committee and having kids in the school at the time, I thought, what's a few days they can make it through? I remember a few hot days. Nothing happened on the school committee. As the years went forward, we had countless surveys uh, from teachers, in initiated by a teacher. What experiences are you feeling on those hot days? Dizziness, headache, inability to, to concentrate, feeling like I'm going to pass out, excessive thirst, not really how you want to pay these employees that we're, we have a huge budget and, and we're paying them not to be able to work. Again, we thought, well, it's just a few days. So eventually it came to uh, contract negotiations with the teachers and they said, what are you going to do? Well, I wasn't in there. So what came out of the contract negotiations, uh, Carol Lisbon was, that's why I'm smiling at her, what came out of it was a memo of understanding that the school committee and the towns will really look and do diligence on this topic that they think is really problematic as employees. I was on the subcommittee that was that MOU and we actually have data for anybody who likes data. Each classroom in the middle school is regulated and the temperature can be taken every hour of every day. When we looked at that data, it's not a few days. We go to school for 182 days, 30 plus days are over 78 percent, uh, 78 degrees in the classrooms. Many of them, many of the times it's in the high 80s, some classrooms are in the 90s. Over the years, we have tried various options instead of air conditioning the building. All of them are for naught. The design of the building appears to be that it retains heat in a really large manner. Those few days where it seems so hot and then it dips, it retains the heat in the buildings. There is an air purge system in there, but it also operates based on humidity levels and, and uh, temperatures. So if the humidity is high outside, it's not purging the, the system. Uh, the windows are very short. They, they're not the big wide ones we used to have, like these ones when we grew up. They only crank open a little bit to replace all those. I mean, it's the bulk of the school, of the school, is classrooms. To replace all those, you're looking up uh, over $200,000. To replace the roof and put a white ru rubber roof on instead of a dark one uh, is also in the $200,000. And then you don't get any of the heat gain in the winter. We put in uh, some trial fan, ceiling fans, in some of the classrooms to see what that does. It's moving excessive heat around. So uh, I am really asking you, if you can't get on board because just like you, I went back you know, 10 years saying, you know, we don't need air conditioning. If you're in that point, I don't know that I can bring you forward to uh, the point where how passionate I feel now. But if you do believe, I ask you to get residents um, to come to town meeting who do understand, who have in the building, been in the building, either for meetings or parent conferences, or last summer when I had to call the superintendent on almost a daily basis to make sure our custodians aren't passing out. Do they have enough water? Are they getting outside where it's cooler? So this is not a luxury. I really do need to get air conditioning in the middle school. And, oh, and, and the FAQ is on the back table. It'll go through what we've tried before and answer some of your other questions. So why aren't we air conditioning all buildings? I can't answer that. I can only say this building is retaining heat and we've been studying it and studying it. We cannot come up with an answer except for air conditioning. Uh, it's partially air conditioned now, so I don't want to say the whole building. We already have some air conditioning in some rooms. Um, and this is... Uh, basically a short little one-page slide, but the FAQ back there will explain it further. And also there's a long presentation. Uh, if you went to the DoverSherborn.org site, you could see graphs and graphs of temperatures in the 80s and the 90s in the classrooms. All right, uh, article. Shelley, before you questions? move on, um, just can you clarify for everyone here tonight which option you're pursuing, whether it's 13 or 14? So that's line? article 13, and that is looking to bond the um, capital item. We are, the Dover Sherburn Regional School Committee is looking to withdraw Article 14, which would have been a different funding mechanism for the same project. Is that enough, Andy? 
Yes? That's great. Do you want to ask about questions for this one before I do the other one or take them together? Yeah, why don't we take those now and then, and then the, the next articles after that. Does anyone have any questions on Articles 13, or I guess just 13? Okay, why don't you move along to Article 15 and 16. Okay, Article 15 is the warrant article that I'll be speaking to, and Article 16, the Regional School Committee is withdrawing at this time. It was also a placeholder. There were two funding mechanisms that we were looking at with both towns. So let me speak to Article 15. This is also capital items. There are um, a number of capital items that the Regional School Committee has pulled out of that 20-year uh, capital assessment. The, the capital assessment, uh, oh, sorry, let me talk to this first. The regional campus uh, in 2003, we saw the, the uh, renovation of the high school, some of the athletic fields, and the building of the middle school and the wastewater treatment facility. Um, and and uh, some upgrades were made to the, the fudge, uh, I'm sorry, the mudge, I saw fudge, the mudge foundation, um, which is in Linquist Commons. Uh, there was minimal work to some of the other areas, the rest of Linquist Commons. So we, for the last 10 years, we've been living off these fabulous buildings that we have, and so s things are starting to come to um, end of cycle. Uh, 2014 and beyond, we asked an outside committee to do a capital assessment. They came back with, um, can you go to the next one, Bill, please? Over $20 million in projects, which scared us. However, they did include the air conditioning in that for the middle school. They did include a lot of the, the field upgrades that the Dover Sherburn boosters are, um, have been saying that they're gonna do for us. So these, these 20 million are not all items that, the, that will be coming forward uh, in, in the next uh, 20 years. And they also include every kind of operational piece to, to maintain the building. But we did have a subcommittee look at it and they looked to see um, how, they, how the projects fall into different categories, which is listed. And uh, they said, well, let's just look at the next two or three years to get a handle of what was needed. Can you go to the next slide, Bill, please? Um, it looks like the same one. Is that the same one? Oh, okay. So what they came up with for uh, this year, they literally took $167,000 of items and said that needs further research. What has come up again and again and again over the last few years without us being, uh, without us addressing are these 122,000. So I'd like to say there's, uh, you know, some spice in there, there isn't. There's been failing VCT flooring at the, the middle school that we've been trying to replace year to year. This will be the last of it, the 47,000. There's masonry, there's um, a snow blower equipment that I've been seeing probably for the last three or four years. So this is sort of the minimum list that we really are asking to respond to now because we looked at the, um, the earliest date we had to do things and the longest date, um, and, and this is really the items that are critical for the earliest date, $122,000. Um, and that's all I have on it. Uh, as I said, Article um, 16 is, to, is the same way but a different funding mechanism, so um, this one's to borrow. Okay, thank you, Shelley. Any questions on Article 15? Thank you, Shelley. Thank you. Article 17 is an article to see if the, if the town will vote to raise and appropriate, appropriate by transfer from available funds or provide by any combination of those methods a sum of money for the purpose of conducting a feasibility study on converting the Bay Colony Railroad line into a recreational path. I think Greg Hills is going to speak to that. Greg. Thank you, Andy, and thank you, Warren Committee. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I know it's been a bit of a long evening, so hopefully I can keep this uh, fairly brief. Uh, I'm a member of the Rail Trail Committee. Uh, it's my pleasure to share with you our progress uh, over the last, uh, you know, 18 months or so. Essentially, we've, uh, we've actually made tremendous progress in the feasibility study that we've been doing to ass assess uh, whether or not this would be a good idea for Dover. Uh, the headline for everybody is that uh, we've answered probably about 75% of the questions that we were looking at. However, there's about another roughly 25% of those that we're at the point where as a committee, 
and as the town, we are unable currently to answer those questions without additional technical resources. So that's where we are. We've been doing our homework and we need a little bit of help on some of the things. But I'll go through a little bit of the details so you can understand. So uh, just as context, as you will all recall, or most of you will recall, we are uh, looking at converting the 3.7 miles of unused rail corridor that goes through town and crosses four streets, Haven, uh, Springdale, Dedham, and Hunt Drive, um, to a recreational path, as we're calling it. And the working assumptions, again, all subject to debate, but the working assumptions are that this would help maintain the rural character of our town. It would not be a paved path. It would not be used by the performance cyclists that are going through our roads, but it would be meant for our families, um, for uh, children riding bikes, um, families pushing strollers, elderly, et cetera. And it's, um, it's unique in the sense that it, it is a straight, flat path. We have a lot of trails in Dover, but a lot of them are through woods and have roots and, are, um, and, and go through, you know, uh, through winding roads. So this would be a very straight path. Uh, and the idea here is that we would control this path in Dover. It's not connected to other, uh, in terms of decision-making processes, to other towns, um, and that there's an opportunity to do this at a limited cost to the town. Um, we've had the Rail Trail Committee working on this feasibility study. Um, last year when I presented here, we asked for $5,000 to offset $5,000 of miscellaneous expenses related to the study, <coughs> of which we've used less than 1000 essentially to set up a website and to send mailings to abutters, basically to keep the community informed of what we were doing. Next slide. So what are we asking in the feasibility study? It's basically two questions. One, is it feasible for Dover to convert this unused rail corridor into a recreational path? And you can imagine the range of questions that we are seeking to ask and answer uh, to address that first question, financial, environmental, legal, public safety, et cetera. The second question is, if yes to number one, then what are the committee's recommendations for what the path should have? What should be the characteristics of this path that would fit with Dover, that would fit with our public safety needs, our butter needs, et cetera? So quite obviously, if the answer to question number one is no, then what we've been doing on question two is moot. We have not yet answered question one, which is why we're asking for additional funding to support doing more research. Next slide. So what, what has been the update? What, are we, uh, what have we done? Uh, so very briefly, we've been very busy. We've had regular meetings. We've had 35 meetings to date, including nine of the last 10 weeks we've met, and we've had members of the public who have attended. Thank you for joining and engaging in those discussions. We have engaged with the community. We created a website. We've got an email list with over 100 people. We've had five informal community meetings of which uh, each had an average of 10 people attending. We, um, we sent an, a, a mailing to all of the abutters to let them know. We have been uh, very proactive in trying to be transparent and engaging folks as much as possible. We've engaged town officials, ComCon, public safety, uh, police, um, board of health, et cetera, to ask for their input on this. We have researched other towns' activities and best practices, over a dozen towns and how they have addressed these issues. Again, not all of those are relevant to Dover, but we wanted to understand. And lastly, we've uh, liaised with Needham and Medfield, who have their own separate processes for, and decision-making uh, structures for considering a, a rail trail, but we've been working with them to understand and, and learn from their processes as well. So, uh, so we have a draft feasibility study, which we will put up on the Dover website tomorrow. Okay, I'm sorry, it's not available tonight, but it will be up tomorrow electronically. It's about 25 pages, and it has all of these contents. This is the table of contents. I do not have time to go through all these today. What I'm going to do is just give headlines of a few of these things so you have a sense of what we've found to date. So first, on the surface, I mentioned it was going to maintain the rural character of the town. The current thinking, and it's not been decided yet what that would be, is it would be either a, uh, a, a recycled asphalt surface, which is sort of a, a packed down surface, it's not paved, but it's sort of packed down, um, or a stone dust surface. But the surface needs to cap the materials that exist on the rail bed. So those are the two potential options. In terms of usage, 
Um, I, I mentioned earlier, it would be anticipated this would be for walking, running, biking, cross-country skiing in the winter. It would not be plowed, but it would not be used for motorized vehicles. It would not be used for horses, although we would have um, horses being able to cross the paths at various places. Um, and, uh, you know, as I said before, it would not be used by performance cyclists because of the nature of the surface. Um, it would not be attractive. Um, it, you know, it's important to mention there's a Friends of the Dover Rail Trail group that has, um, that has been created, separate from our committee, but uh, citizens have created this. There's over 100 people, and they have expressed interest in doing the maintenance um, jointly with the town, as well as doing fundraising and community outreach. Public safety. Uh, in, in the research the committee's done and in talking with uh, the police and the police talking to other towns, there's no uh, quantifiable negative impact of rail trails to abutters into the community. That's not to say that there aren't uh, incidents that happen as they happen off of trails as well, but there's no quantifiable evidence both in other towns that have rail trails but also within Dover, where we already have trails that abut, um, abut people's homes um, in Nona, Woodlands, and elsewhere. Uh, rules, we've got a list of rules that you can see in the feasibility study in terms of, you know, it will only be open during the day, uh, no dogs, um, you know, we'll have signage, et cetera. You can go through those. Um, governance, we would recommend, you know, again, if the answer is that this is feasible, we recommend a separate standing committee instead of this ad hoc committee that would work closely with the town uh, and the friends group to, to manage the issues. And then lastly, on parking, we determined that there's plenty of parking for what the anticipated needs are. There's over 155 spots just in the center of town alone um, that would be useful for folks to park and then use the trail. So, uh, last slide here. Uh, what is the warrant article request? So as I said before, we don't have all the answers. And you know, it would be really silly uh, for us to go to town meeting and recommend a trail or a recreational path without being able to answer some really critical issues here. I mean, people in this town are too smart and care too much about the town to let that happen. So we're not gonna waste people's time with that. But what we wanna do is actually answer these questions because there's folks that think this might be a good idea. So let me take you through this very quickly. The right of way review. Essentially what this is, is the need to hire a, a licensed site planner to look at the right of way, look at the easements, and look at some of the land use history to make sure that there's no issues there. Secondly, the MBA, MBTA lease terms. The town would have to lease this corridor from the MBTA and there's a thick contract. We need to be comfortable with the terms in that and at this point, we're not. So we need to understand what all the implications of that from a liability perspective and otherwise. Thirdly, engineering analysis. Um, you know, as we look at the existing rail bed, there's things like culverts, things like uh, some steep embankments in some places. We need to figure out what needs to be done with those to be safe. Uh, construction contracting. Um, as we uh, consider engaging an outfit that's going to help with the conversion of the, the rail trail, um, we need to understand all of the specifications for that. And then lastly, an environmental review. We've got, um, there's questions that exist that we are unable to answer as a committee and as a town. So that's, that's where we are. This is the request, the Warren article request in terms of a dollar amount, at this point is estimated to be $50,000 to cover the, the sort of technical needs that cannot currently be met by the committee in the town. Thank you, Greg. Are there any questions? Yes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Martha Bull in Nine Partridge Hill Road. Um, I've attended almost every single one of the rail trail meetings, I along with maybe four or five other people. And um, I think it's important to talk about numbers here before you decide to support this warrant. There's approximately 5,500 people in Dover, and I find it difficult to believe the posting that's on the rail trail website says three quarters of Dover supports the rail trail. So you're talking over 3,000 people. When I first started to go to the meetings, my concern was the lack of communication. And I had su suggested to the committee that maybe they should send out 
notices in our tax bills so people were aware of what was going on. But the meetings that I attended, there were maybe top six of us at the meetings. Um, the number of abutters that were, my understanding from going to the meetings, the number of abutters that were approached, the number was 70. Six to 12 abutters were, would receive the most impact from the rail trail. And supposedly they did receive letters. Um, emails were sent out, but only if you knew enough to sign up for the emails. So I don't really even know how many people were receiving emails about the meetings. The web page, I was told to read the web page, and when I would ask people at the market or at the transfer station, are you aware of what's coming into town possibly, people didn't know what I was talking about. And I suggested they go to this web page. Um, there were supposedly five informal meetings, and at one of the last Real Trail meetings, we asked how many abutters attended those meetings. I heard the number 11, I heard the number 17. The Friends of the Rail Trail pulled together um, some signatures through emails, and the figure that I heard was 190 signatures. So the numbers aren't adding up to three quarters of the town supporting this. The usage, in the document that was handed out tonight, it talked about um, the committee, um, the roadways given um, the limited sidewalks in town. <coughs> There's a reason that we have limited sidewalks in town. There's a rural nature to Dover. There's a character, an ambiance in the town. And that's why we've limited the number of sidewalks in this town. Excuse me, I'm so nervous. Um, it's a whole character that we're discussing, not only with Carroll Park, but bringing in a, an asphalt or a recycled asphalt through the center of town. I live in Donnelly Estates, and I don't, we have to, We've actually had the police put up boulders at the beginning of the trails along Hunt Drive because kids were driving in there and parking and having great parties. Um, and according to one of the meetings, the trustees of reservation came and did a presentation. And Mike said at that meeting that last year alone, 30,000 people used the trails in Dover and less than one third of those people were from Dover. He also discussed that the parking was an issue with what we already have, the, the miles of trails that we have in Dover, which are absolutely wonderful. And the parking is an issue already with that. And they're talking about looking for a new parking place over near Powesset Street. When the town empties out in the summer, I guess my question is, how many residents are going to be here from the Friends of the Rail Trail? To be using the rail trail, or maintaining it or monitoring it. And that brings me to the rules of the rail trail. The rules and regulations that have been discussed at the meetings that I've attended are no dogs, no dog walkers, no horses will be allowed to ride on the trail, and Dover's history is 115 years of horses in Dover with Norfolk Hunt Club. It's a wonderful part of the culture of the town. But horses will be allowed to cross in six designated areas over 3.5 miles. No motorized vehicles. So who's going to be monitoring the trail? Who's going to, if someone falls, they talk about putting mile markers up every one-tenth of a mile so that the businesses in town can buy one to put one up so when someone falls, they can call the police and say, I'm at the... Dover Market Rail Trail mile marker, come get me. So I'm concerned. It's supposed to be only open from dusk to dawn. Who's going to monitor that? So um, I Martha, guess do you have a question with respect to the presentation that Greg gave specifically on this year's warrant article? I understand it sounds like you've got you know, concerns about the, the underlying project, well, but what about this year, the feasibility study? Well, I guess my, I have two concerns. One, you talk about the parking, and I wanted to know, you had talked about um, contacting the local merchants, the, ch the churches, and the legion to see if those places have been contacted. And also, um, I understand that a meeting was held recently with the Department of Conservation and Recreation, and that there's a possibility that they may get involved, and that will put a completely different spin on it. 
So those are my two questions. Have the people, how can you communicate this better to the town to be prepared for the town meeting? Have the local merchants been addressed? And how is the DCR going to impact this? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for the questions. Uh, so uh, in terms of the communication question, you know, we've, uh, if you have additional creative ideas, we've, we've really gone out of our way to try to be transparent and put things in the papers, website, emails, letters. I think that um, tell your friends, tell your neighbors, we would love for everyone to come to our meetings and be involved. Um, but you know, there's a limit to how much we can um, spoon feed folks um, without them reading stuff that's available for folks. That's one. Term two, in terms of the parking, um, the parking question, the two things. One, you mentioned that there, the TTOR had mentioned that there was parking constraints for No Nut Woodlands, which is true. The parking assessment that we did is at the center of town, 155 spots available. Uh, I don't believe, I'm looking at my committee members, that we actually looked at any private facilities. That was all public parking spaces. So that would be incremental to that. Um, and then lastly, the DCR meeting that you asked about. Uh, DCR is, is uh, convened a meeting uh, to discuss various uh, rail trail projects. Uh, I was not in attendance, uh, but I think it's just really early stage discussions. I don't know where they're going on that. But, um, but Kate did attend and can pro probably provide more insight on if it's, uh, if it's material. Hi, Kate Canny, 7 Cross Street. There was a meeting held last Wednesday with the DCR and it brought together multiple towns that are in the process of either developing a rail trail or have developed a rail trail. So it was an, an opportunity for groups to share their experiences. Also, Dan Dris Driscoll of DCR shared some of his thoughts about construction and ongoing projects, but it's very early stages. And he actually did state that these projects are local projects that DCR isn't gonna get involved as the management, the construction, or the funding. So it was just an advisory meeting. The last thing I just, for a point of clarification, is the, the, the point about the three quarters of the towns. The, what we were using is three quarters of respondents to the long range planning survey had indicated that, not three quarters of, of the citizens. So that was, that's, that's the, the data that you're pointing to. It's three, three quarters of the respondents to the survey. Any other questions? Yes, in the back. Tom Crowley, Cedar Hill Road. Could you please tell us what the appropriation is going to be, how much money at this point in time? I, 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 I said $50,000. 50, I can't hear I said $50,000. $50,000. Yes. And what is the anticipated cost of all these things you've got up here? So the $50,000 would cover the costs of what we have up here, up it, to. It'll cover engineering analysis, environmental review, and all those particular categories. Yes. That's okay. Can you also tell us what the request will be for the senior center? You didn't include that earlier. Thank you. The, the senior center article, uh, our understanding is it's been withdrawn or is going to be withdrawn, which is why we didn't include that. Yep. Yes. Uh, good evening. My name is Phil Trotter, and I live on Center Street. Um, I was wondering, of the $50,000 that you're hoping to get, are there any, is, is this list going to be prioritized? So, for example, if you spend $5,000 and there's an item that's a showstopper, will it then uh, uh, terminate the project or will you continue? For example, I didn't hear anything about the trestle bridge. That might be off the table. But I'm wondering if there's an environmental review done as item number one, let's say, and uh, some hazardous waste or something like that is, is found on the uh, site, would that be a showstopper and the project uh, discontinue, or how do you propose to prioritize the spending? Yeah, that's a good question. I, mean, I don't think we've, we've talked about the sequencing of, of the legal and environmental and engineering reviews, but my assumption would be that if we found something that was indeed a showstopper that would make it infeasible for the town to do it, then we would not continue with additional research on other areas. But and we haven't gotten to that level of, of planning around the sequencing yet. And the rail trestle bridge, um, 
you know, for now is off the table. It's not something that we are recommending that we consider at all. Yeah, or maybe right bef before it, sort of, yeah. So, but yes, yeah, so there would be a recommendation, again, assuming a lot of other questions are answered, that, uh, that yeah, that, that it, there, it, there's some sort of barricade that prevents people from, from unsafely crossing the trestle. Okay, thank you. If this could be the last question on this article. Kevin Van, 7 Pleasant Street. First of all, I want to thank the committee because you put a lot of time and energy into this and, and uh, it's been noted. Um, I am the chairperson of the Friends Group and there are 165 people, there's some confusion about that number, who signed a petition online hoping to push this forward. Um, <coughs> the, the important thing here is that um, the Friends Group feels like we need to go farther. You've taken us sort of three quarters of the way there in terms of you know, what we need to know, but we're not there. And so it's important that May 6 is not about whether or not we should do the rail trail, it's about whether or not we should do a feasibility study. And I, I don't think we have enough information right now, at least from the, the friends group, to make that determination, but we want to go forward. We want to investigate the engineering, the legal, the construction, environmental, because right now I don't think, and the group doesn't feel, like there's enough information to really decide that. So I'd just like to say that there is a group of people, very enthusiastic, think this would be a great addition to our town, but we don't feel like we're quite there yet. And so we should stay focused on a feasibility study that'll do a very deep dive, get us 100% of the way there, so this town can make a good decision about whether or not we should move forward. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, sir, last one. Good evening, Ted Kramer, 31 Center Street. Um, first, thank you for all the work you guys have done. It's, it's great progress. Um, I love the trails here in Dover, but I'm not a big supporter of this effort. And if we do undertake the project, I just want to make sure we think about a couple things. One is, um, right now it's very much framed as a Dover-centric effort, and we seem to be marginalizing all of the Medfield Needham opportunities. But I, I think it's important if the town's going to consider this effort that we really look at the master plan, particularly as it gets to usage and volume estimates. Um, I think that's, that's a big part of the program, and it seems to be, I've been to a couple of the meetings, and it's always, don't worry about that, we'll, we're focused in the middle. And then the second is, and this ties together, is really the usage estimates, and I know it looked like it was part of your um, assessment up there, but as I go through the numbers in Dover and the number of people who could potentially use it, it's a pretty small number, and I'm particularly concerned about the number, the percentage of people that are Dover versus outside of town. And I think that as you look at the character of Dover and the number of people who are here and who would be using it regularly, I think those are pretty small numbers. So if the town was going to come up with estimates, it would seem like having a group go through and do a study, make sure it has some really rigorous planning and numbers behind it would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. Sure. Come on up. Yep. Yep. I'm sorry, but I sat down and my dear husband said, is that $853,000 Dover share? What's Sherman paying? And I said, I can't believe I missed that. So, <laughs> so thank you. No, that is with Sherburn. So um, the original school committee uh, budget that I showed you under Article 4, that included both the air conditioning and the 122000 in capital items. So it's no additional funds outside of the regional request, which is um, a 3.08 um, budget increase. So in terms of those two capital items, it looks it's, it's about $96,000, slightly under, uh, for Dover over five years. Thank you, husband. Thank you, Shelley. Okay, uh, the next article on the warrant is Article 18, 
um, which is an article to say if the town will vote to amend the zoning bylaws of the town prohibiting medical marijuana treatment centers in all zoning districts and further to determine whether such prohibitions will be permanent or will remain in effect for only a limited period of time sufficient for the promulgation of state regulations for such centers and the development of a zoning plan. And I think Amy DeSanto, Amy, are you here? Yes, is going to speak on this article. You're a hearty bunch to still all be here this late into the evening. Um, I'm just going to speak quickly on behalf of SPAN DS with regard to this article. SPAN DS is a community organization that serves Dover and Sherburne, and you may not have heard of us before, but we are uh, the Substance Prevention and Awareness Network in Dover, Sherburne, and we've been in existence since 2002. We're very active um, at the schools and in the community. We have faculty and administration from the middle school, the high school, uh, parents, we, we work very closely with law enforcement from both Dover and Sherburne, and health and business professionals, volunteers from all walks of life in both towns are interested in the work that we do. We also have parent reps from uh, grades 6 through 12, which is really great because we are trying to uh, really raise awareness for the problem that we have in our communities around alcohol and other drug abuse. Um, I will say right off the bat, if we can have the next slide, that we are all about prevention. And you can see our mission is to prevent and decrease substance abuse in our communities, especially among our youth. Along those lines, we become very familiar with issues surrounding drug and alcohol use, specifically marijuana, with relation to this article, I want to say right off the bat that in no way, um, as a SPAN DS representative, are we saying that we do not uh, endorse the law that was voted into place in November legally by the uh, residents of Massachusetts, question three, that allows for the use the legalization of medical marijuana. So that is not an issue. What is at issue um, ours is this medical marijuana treatment center um, issue that has arisen. So within the state of Massachusetts, within the first year of this law being passed, there will be the opportunity for there to be 35 medical marijuana treatment centers uh, uh, created in Massachusetts, and that's just in the first year. So there has been uh, some talk among, in many towns, about preventing an establishment of a medical marijuana treatment center within the towns. Now, just last week, to keep things interesting, the Attorney General passed a ruling saying that any town that seeks to ban a medical marijuana treatment center uh, will be struck down. So any articles like this would be struck down which leaves us with a moratorium. In, in sort of layman's terms, what's happened is we passed the medical marijuana initiative, but we didn't have any further uh, regulations as to how this would all play out. We did absolutely put the cart before the horse. And one of the things that happens within our communities, especially among our youth, um, is that with the with the familiarity and the, the visibility of marijuana in our communities, the perceived risk of marijuana use goes down among our youth. And when the perceived risk goes down, the usage goes up. Now, I could give you all kinds of stats about how um, even medical marijuana is not endorsed by the AMA and other things. You, know, you can go on our website, SpanDS, and see all kinds of information about that, but really what we're talking about here is the perceived risk among our youth and its, um, its impact on our kids. If I could have the next slide. You'll see that um, we did do, Span DS helped to bring a survey to the region where we got data about marijuana use from our students. And in ninth grade, we saw that 9% uh, of our students were using, and by the time they got to their senior year, 61% uh, 
um, of our students were using. Now, again, the presence of a me medical marijuana treatment center in our town really legitimizes the use in the mind of a teen. And it is a problem. They are driving cars and doing all kinds of things. The, the regs surrounding a medical marijuana treatment center really haven't been established. Um, I took this picture uh, myself in Southern California where my, ton my son attends school. And because I was approached by a green doctor asking if I had a headache. Um, and this is, you know, we think they're going to look like CVS or Walmart, but they don't. They look like what this slide shows. You get um, a very unprofessional uh, approach to the use of medical marijuana. And we just feel, Span Diaz feels in agreement with the selectmen that this is something that we might not want to have in Dover. <coughs> so we're asking that you would support what could now really only be a moratorium on this article. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Amy. Are there any questions on this article? Nancy? How long is this moratorium going to last? That's my question. Is it a year? Can we, get, can, can we go for a year? Can we go for two years? It, it might be a 20 year. 20 years? I think at this point, I don't know. Do you know, Dave? If I may, it's determined by the process. We agree that the regulations are promulgated by the Department of Public Health, and we've been able to present a story in So at the very least, a year. Could be longer if the regulations don't come out, or for some reason, the regulations require or have an ounce over them. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Amy. Okay. We're almost there, folks. Um, article 19, uh, which is the next article, it is an article promulgated by the Warrant Committee. Um, that is an article to fund the 2014 Reserve Fund. Um, as you may or may not know, every year uh, the town meeting funds the reserve fund to cover unexpected expenses that may occur during the course of a fiscal year. For the last couple of years, we funded that in the amount of $250,000 a year, uh, and that's the amount that's being sought for 2014. Article 20 um, is also a warrant committee article. It's to see if the town will vote to raise an appropriate, appropriate by transfer from available funds or provide by any other combination a sum of money to pay any unpaid bills. At this time, we don't have any, but, but the possibility does exist uh, between now and town meeting that that could occur. Article 21 deals with uh, supplemental appropriations to Article 4. Um, again, uh, no known supplemental appropriations at this time. Article 22 is the transfer of free cash. Um, as you saw in the revenue sources sheet tonight, uh, that figure is currently about $1.6 million based on the preliminary budget that's being developed or that has been developed. Um, that number is obviously subject to fluctuation, but that's the figure right now. Um, and that would be plugged into Article 22 uh, at town meeting. Article 23 is an article from the selectmen to um, provide a sum of money to supplement the town stabilization fund. And I'm told that at this time there's no intent to uh, provide any money to supplement the town stabilization fund so that that article will likely be withdrawn at town meeting. And the last article on the warrant is Article 24, which is the uh, listing of elected officials. Uh, the election is Monday, May 20th. Uh, we would urge you all to vote. So with that, that is the list of articles for this year's town meeting. I want to thank everybody for coming and participating, and we'll look forward to seeing you on May 6th. Thank you.